There we go. Um, good morning, Northwoods Baptist Church. Um, we're excited about uh, being in lesson number seven today. Uh, lesson number seven is called the Wall of Protection. So uh, we built a wall here, but uh, the Wall of Protection uh, that we're looking at, uh, the second hook of destruction, it goes against uh, the rebellion against authority. It follows closely on the heels of the first one, but the uh, uh, the second hook is uh, entitled to um, is uh, draw and devour. But um, uh, specifically, it deals with authority, authority in the home, and authority in the life of the the young people, and uh, authority in our life, and keeping authority where it needs to be. Um, it strikes at the root of the very foundation of a spiritual problem and spiritual stability: Bible authority. For both a child and a parent, uh, it is a protective fortress intended by God to shield um, from spiritual attacks. Thus, the attempt of the enemy is to literally draw you out from behind the protective hedge, the protective wall, if you will, of biblical authority so that he can get a clear shot at you. Uh, authority is a word that most people uh, hate to hear about, and uh, it's something that we don't really like because it's something we need to submit to. Um, one popular bumper sticker or a mantra of our, uh, of our society is question authority. And with that, they mean uh, suspect authority and resist authority. Now, the subtle lie, there's a subtle lie there embedded. The phrase that authority is bad and it has to be uh, questioned. It has to be broken free from. Actually, godly authority wouldn't mind being questioned. Uh, they wouldn't mind, uh, would mind you asking them questions uh, with a desire to learn and to understand. Um, godly authority in your life would love for you to question them. And then to listen with an open heart of reason and understanding, understanding to, um, to answers from God's Word. So I say, kids, teenagers, young people, go ahead. Take your best shot. Think of your toughest questions that you can and opened up. Bring those questions to your parents, to your pastor. Uh, bring them and ask them. Go ahead, really make them sweat with your questions. Make them difficult, but play fair. If you ask a question, listen to the answers. Consider the proof that's offered on behalf of those answers, and really research the outcomes. You might be surprised at what you find. In the book of Psalms, 147, verse 11, it says, uh, 147, verse 11, it says, The Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him, in those that hope in his mercy, Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise thy God, O Zion, for he hath strengthened the bars of thy gates, and he hath blessed thy children within thee. I love that statement in the middle there of verse number 13. It says, For he hath strengthened the bars of thy gates, and hath blessed thy children within thee. Now, there's two ways that we can look at this passage, and that we can look at verse 13. Jerusalem sounds like a, we can look at it firstly, Jerusalem sounds like a pretty locked up tight fortress. Um, It, it sounds like a, Sounds like that he has strengthened the bars of thy gates. What's that all about? Is that a prison camp? Uh, it sounds pretty rough. Obviously, this is a skewed perspective of what the bars and the gates uh, mentioned in this verse. In ancient times, the people in the city, they wanted their walls to be solid. They wanted them to be, to be sure and steadfast um, because the wall would actually um, defend them against potential enemies. The walls and the gates didn't serve to imprison the people, but to protect the people, and to keep the enemy out. This is also why many people have fences around their yards. They have fences around their yards because they want to keep people out of their yards. Um, it's, but it's also for the protection of their children. When we lived in St. Joe, uh, Missouri, we lived on a busy one-way street, and we had a big fence in the backyard. Now, that fence in the backyard, it wasn't to imprison our kids. It was to keep our children safe from climbing over the fence and getting into our neighbor's yard that had a dog or uh, getting out of the alley and getting hit by a, a car that would be going too fast or getting out in the street and meeting a UPS truck. Um, it also kept it to where um, people who would intend to do harm to our kids um, wouldn't be able to notice or to see them there. And um, the kids, I never once went to the backyard and saw my kids angry and mad at our fence. I never walked out there and saw one of our kids sitting there saying, I hate this fence, I don't like it, and kicking against it and fighting against that fence. Um, they were too busy enjoying the fun inside the fence that they never even noticed this fence. Uh, similarly, I'm sure that no doubt there were dinner times around Jerusalem. 
And as they sat down around the dinner at Jerusalem, um, as they're having family conversation, I, I imagine no one ever said, I sure hate these walls around our city. They block our view. Um, it makes it to where we feel like we're imprisoned in the city. Because that's not what the walls did. The walls was a source of protection. I have many times sit across the desk or across the table or sit in a chair next to a fence-fighting teenager. I don't understand for the life of me why they resist the fence or why they fight against the fence. Um, I can't figure out why they want to play in the street, why they want to get risk being bitten by a pit bull or hit by a UPS truck, um, or chance biting into, back to our illustration, a razor sharp hook. Rebellious children and rebellious people only see the fence. They completely miss the protection, the safety, the advantages that the fence gives them. They never see the love, the compassion, and the care that the fence builders in their life have for them. They ignore the blessings of all the great things within the fence, the fun, the freedom, the safety, the security, because they're too busy trying to break free that they never realize what, what they're breaking free from is safety, and they're going to be entering the freedom of a lion hungry uh, of a hungry lion cage. Rebellious children and young people are not prisoners to the rules. They're prisoners to their own blindness and ignorance. Those who fight godly authority, fight against their own safety. Eventually, they will break free from authority, only to find themselves exposed and vulnerable and easily reeled in into a bloody fish cooler. So let's take a look at authority and this wall of protection that God has given us and how he desires to draw us out and how the devil desires to draw us out and devour us. The first thing we want to look at today is just the simple truth that, number one, God's design of authority is universal. God's design of authority is universal. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Be ye followers of me, as I am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things, and keep the ordinances I delivered unto you. I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of every woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. We read this passage because it lets us know everyone is under authority. That's number one. Uh, understand everyone lives under authority. No, letter A, sorry. Every, uh, understand everyone lives under authority. You're never going to live a day in your life whenever you're not required to answer to some authority. You will never outgrow it. You'll never go beyond it. You'll never escape it. Everyone lives under authority. And the sooner we realize and understand that, and accept that as part of life, the sooner that you're going to be able to grow in spiritual maturity. Letter B, accept authority as a God-given part of life. God is the one who established authority. We need to accept authority as being God-given. If you're just absolutely sick of authority, you just can't take your parents anymore, you can't take the authority that God's given you anymore, then here's what you do. You move out, you get a job, pay your own rent, drive your own car, pay your own bills, answer to the boss, the landlord, and the, the traffic patrolman, you, uh, you're you still under authority. But finally, if you realize that, hey, I can't handle the rules of my parents, then get out of their authority and consider joining the military. Um, <laughs> I'm joking here um, because of the realization is no matter where you're at, you're still going to be under authority. You're under the authority of someone else. Uh, letter uh, number B, number Number two, <laughs> number two, um, recognize earthly authority will never be perfect. Number two, earthly authority will never be perfect. In uh, 1 Samuel chapter 18, 1 Samuel chapter 18, uh, verse 9, we're given a picture of this. First Samuel 18, 9. Verse 9, it says, And Absalom met the... That's 2 Samuel. I apologize for that. 1 Samuel 18, 9. It says, And saw I David from that time forward, and it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit of God came upon Saul, and he prophesied in the midst of the house. And David played with his hand as at other times, and there was a javelin in Saul's hand. And Saul cast the javelin, for he said, I will smite David to the wall with it. And David avoided out of his presence twice. 
and Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him and was um, departed from Saul. Verse 13, Therefore Saul removed him from him and made him his captain over a thousand, and he went out and came before the people. And David behaved himself wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. When therefore Saul saw that David behaved himself very wisely, he was afraid. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. In this passage, we see that Saul was an authority, um, but Saul was not a perfect authority. Number two, once again, we just said earthly authority will never be perfect. We could all bemoan the failures of earthly authorities. We could take time to testify how earthly authorities have messed up and done us wrong. Um, our national justice system is not perfect. Our law enforcement um, agencies, they sometimes fail. No school teacher is always right. At home, it's a secret. I'm going to come and whisper this to the kids. At home, mom and dad will sometimes be wrong. Sometimes they're going to act out of, out of anger, and sometimes they're going to react with a less than spirit-filled answers. If you're looking for failure as a reason to distrust and defy God's plan for authority, you're not going to have to look very far because human humanity is fallen. Our world is a corrupt place, and no earthly authority will ever be perfect or accurate 100% of the time. Letter A. Human authority can be forfeited. It can be forfeited. Certainly, there are lines that are crossed, uh, and uh, crossed, and those in authority by those that are in authority, and by reason of a choice, naturally, they forfeit their right to authority or influence. In the case of a father who leaves his family, his authority and the lives of his children are somewhat forfeited. In the case of a government official that breaks his laws. His authority is forfeited, and his position must be filled by another. And these illustrations can go on and on. Uh, but make no mistake, I'm not advocating deliberate abuse of authority. Exactly the opposite. I believe that when God gives someone authority, he holds them to the strictest accountability. I believe as one who holds some authority in my own home and as some in the life of others, that authority brings a huge stewardship with the influence. Everyone in authority must answer to those that they serve, and ultimately to God for how they use that authority. If you have a position of authority, you know how unworthy you must uh, must feel to have it, and how pressured you must feel to exercise that authority in the grace of God. It's a huge weight of stewardship that no wise authority uh, figure is ever going to take lightly. I'm simply, simply stating the fact that human authority falls short. That doesn't negate the authority, the authority in our life. Just because the human authority falls short doesn't mean we don't need to trust in that human authority. It doesn't mean we don't have to obey that human authority. B, God commands us to honor uh, to honor uh, authority in spite of imperfections. God commands us to honor authority in spite of imperfections. In other words, just because there are a few bad policemen in the world doesn't mean that we can disrespect and disobey all of them. The fact is we need every one of them. Just because there are some abusers of power in religious and governing institutions doesn't mean we should resist every, every pastor, every church, or every public officer. The fact is our spiritual health and our national freedom depends upon these authorities. And these positions need to be filled with trustworthy people, people who understand the, the stewardship and labor diligently to serve, protect, and honor those that they serve. Bringing it a little closer to home, the fact that your parents are human and aren't perfect doesn't give you a right to resist their God-given place in your life. They will not always be right. They will not always respond with perfect grace and godliness. They will not always make the right calls. Nevertheless, they're still your parents. And they, still, uh, they are still God's greatest gifts, gift to you. Number three. Number three. Earthly authority is given for our protection, not for our persecution. Earthly authority is given for our protection, not for our persecution. Ezekiel chapter 22, uh, verse 28, it says, uh, And her prophets have dubbed them uh, with untempered mortar, 
seeing uh, vanity and divining lies unto them, saying, Thus saith the Lord God, When the Lord hath not spoken, the people of the land have used oppression and exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and needy. Yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. And I saw for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. The picture in this passage is one of oppression, fear and, and distrust and devastation. One group of people is being afflicted by another group of people and God is displeased. And he is searching and seeking and looking for someone who will stand in the gap. A man who will make up the hedge. The hedge that he refers to um, was, the, was the one thing that could have given safety and protection for these oppressed people. The gap in the hedge, it, it's a hole in the wall, allowing the tyranny to reign and for freedom to die. Um, in your mind, that hedge, uh, let that hedge be the authorities in your life. The spiritual wall of protection, that's A. The authority is the hedge of protection. Your parents, your pastor, your teacher, they are diligently laboring to stand in the gap, to make up the hedge. They're willing to fight off the spiritual enemies, uh, to force back the oppressors on your behalf. They are willing to sh shoulder the burden uh, of your safety. They don't have to, but they are being obedient to their own authority by doing what God has assigned them to do. They could move to the mountains and raise a fish hatchery if they wanted to, but no, they ought to fight on your behalf. What a gift. Let her be inside the wall is safety. Those standing in the gap have expressed the greatest kind of love known to humanity. They're giving their life for you, for your safety. Yet, because many kids, many young people, many people can't see the enemy, they opt to distrust them. All you see is the hedge. It's blocking your view and it's ticking you off. Um, do you know what these people, do you know what these people um, are thinking? It's making you mad. Who do these people think they are? They're hedging you in, cramping your style, keeping you down. Uh, they're restricting your freedom and controlling your life. So you, in all of your grand stupidity, yeah, I use that word. I'm sorry, parents, you can explain it later. In all your ignorance, um, start kicking and screaming and punching and biting and spitting the wall against the wall. You decide, I'm going to break free, exist, and resist at all cost. Inside that wall is safety, but just over the hedge is a desert wasteland of spiritual desolation. Just beyond that wall is a fierce lion, a vicious meat-eating enemy, hoping you'll break out. Did you get that? The devil is cheering you on. Yeah, break free. Break free. Well, uh, look at all those locks. Look at those rules. Look at that authority. Come on out here where the air is clean and the view is wide. He hopes you'll break through that hedge. Let her see outside of the hedge is the enemy. And depending upon the strength of your ignorant persistence, the resolve of those standing in your gap, you might just break free. And when you do, it'll be open season on you. You'll all of a sudden be alone in a bloody land of slaughtered rebels and a fat lion You'll be the devil's ground beef in no time. Young man, young lady, that hedge is there as God's greatest gift of spiritual protection in your life. God's greatest gift is your parents. Letter D, parents are kids' greatest spiritual defense. God's greatest gift is your parents. You can't see the battle. You can't see the enemy. But those in authority in your life, they can. You can trust them and stay safe. Or you can resist them and break free. You will then see for yourself in a painful reality that the enemy is real and that you are vulnerable. Number four. Thankful for this one. Authority is a protective gift from God. Authority serves as a protective gift from God. Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse number 8, Solomon says, He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it, and whoso breaketh an hedge 
a serpent shall bite him. God's given us a gift, which is our parents. Those who shoulder the biblical authority shoulder the spiritual battle on the behalf of others. That's letter A. Spiritual authority carries the burden of the spiritual battle. It's no picnic or pleasant thing. It's an, <laughs> The easiest way to live life is to avoid becoming someone else's authority. Go with me to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians 6, verse 7 and 8. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to the flesh shall the flesh reap corruption, but he soweth to the Spirit shall the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Those in authority in your life that carry a spiritual pressure for your well-being that you cannot understand and fight a battle for you for protection that you cannot even see. Can you comprehend the indescribable gift that it is to have someone in your life who will fight the forces of darkness on your behalf? Have you ever realized that when your parents go toe-to-toe -to -toe with you, when your pastor um, powerfully declares the spirit of truth from the pulpit, when your spiritual authorities engage in battle on your behalf, that it's an act of passionate and fiery love? It's because they love and they care about you. Letter B, uh, engaging in spiritual battle is an act of fiery love. It's an act of fiery love because they risk your hate, your resentment, your rejection, but they love you too much to let you get hurt. They would rather be rejected or hated than to see you go down without a fight. Let her see. Every child crave, craves that type of love. <laughs> That's the kind of amazing love your heart craves. Why would you resist it? Well, why would you try to break free from it? Why would you run from it? Why would you mistreat it? Our only recourse and our only answer needs to be to stop fighting and to start thinking thanking your spiritual authorities. That's letter D. Stop fighting and start thanking your spiritual authorities. Stop fighting the fence and start being grateful for the safety, for the fiery love that God has placed in your life. Start thanking your spiritual authorities uh, for standing in the gap, making your hedge, and most importantly, start taking advantage of the incredible protection that you have to prepare your own life for an adult journey. That wall of authority around you, around your life, will give you a fantastic advantage as you become adult. Unless you break free and don't live in long enough, to get there. I'm thankful for the spiritual authorities and the walls that God's placed in our life so that, so that we can grow and mature in safety. Parents, make the determination to stand in the gap for your children. Children, make the determination not to fight that wall, but to be thankful for it.